What is up, everybody? Mr. Purtis here. Welcome to unit number two, Networks of Exchange. This is on trade routes. Here's the trick to this. This again is circa 1200 to 1450. We are going back and connecting some of those empires and civilizations from unit number one. And now we're going to kind of place them down on trade routes. So we're going to look at the Silk Road, the Indian Ocean trade route, Trans-Saharan trade. We're going to drop a little Mongols in there because who doesn't like little Mongols? So there's going to be a lot going on in this unit that's going to connect back. I'm not going to review a lot of the stuff from unit one, but you will see it kind of pop in a little bit. Then it'll pop back out again. Then it'll go in. We'll round and around. We'll go. So here's the deal. This is unit or part 2.1. This is on the Silk Road. This video, um, again, circa 1200 to 1450. Let's get into this. So first thing, I just want you to be clear, and I said this in the China video, and I want to say it in this video again, China is not isolated. They are not isolated at all in this course. Now, they do limit trade and limit who comes into their country, but they are not like closed off totally, okay? So that global one AP9 idea of like China being isolated is not happening here. China is open for business because people want stuff that China has. And this is the Silk Road. Hopefully everyone knows this. It's not just silk that's traded and it is not like a one four lane highway road going from China to the Middle East. It is multiple different paths. There are trade centers along the way, which is indicated by each little dot here on this map. And all along the red here is the Silk Road. Um, this area coming down here is the Indian Ocean trade route and just other trade routes out. But this is what we're going to focus on today, which is this red here. Silk Road gets its name because China produces silk and for a while had a monopoly on silk and silkworms. But that's another story for another day. So here's the deal. Around 1200, circa 1200, there's going to be an increase in trade along the Silk Road. There's a whole bunch of reasons for them. But one thing I just want to start with here is there's a whole bunch of new innovations. If you don't know the word innovation, it's just invention. New things that are going to happen and they're going to improve in China on past technologies. So the first thing that you need to understand is that China, the government, okay, so we're talking about the Song Dynasty, is going to promote trade. They are a strong government, and they're going to attempt to promote trade in order to increase their wealth because you can tax stuff if you're a government, and when you tax stuff, you make money for yourself. The first is, in the Song Dynasty, we have the development of money economy. What I mean by money is the same thing when you reach into your wallet and you pull out a dollar bill, China is going to use currency now not everyone uses currency in the rural countryside you're not going to see currency but merchants and with the promotion through the song dynasty they're going to actually promote and encourage the use of coins the coins that are going to be used are primarily copper and bronze during the song era and this is an example of what it would look like this is issued by the government it is a standard eyes measurement and standardized worth so the government weighs these coins and by the, the the square here and the stamp you know it is official currency that can be used and you know how much copper or bronze is going to be in that coin that's a huge thing for trade and the reason why this increases trade is imagine every time you went into a store or bought something you had to barter it you had to basically say like i'm going to give you this hesh truck right here for for uh avocados and they're like nah i don't really want that maybe something else and you're like okay i got this pen here i'll give you this pen for half an avocado and that's how it used to work now you just standardize the currency so you know people can be like i want three copper coins for that now i'll give you two okay two it's easier than just trying to find what you have on to negotiate also in the song dynasty they have something called flying cash and what flying cash is it's basically paper money it's a piece of paper that you can exchange for goods and then you can take to a bank and buy and exchange for actual coin currency so it's called flying cash because you can take it along your route um, also there's credit if you don't know how credit works you basically can buy something it's a letter from this is in this case a letter from the bank saying we will kind of front this this letter from the bank for the equivalent of the united states like a thousand dollars we will front this and you can use this and then bring that bank note back um, and we'll supply it. So it's credit. If you have a credit card, you know someone with a credit card, basically the bank is saying, we know you're good for this money or we hope you are. And if you're not good for it, you're going to owe us money later on in what is called interest, which is how one-way banks make their money. Also, along the, tri along the Silk Road, there's something called the Caravansari. Pardon my horrible pronunciation of that. But the Caravansari, think of the root of the word caravan which is just groups of people traveling along the Silk Road, there's going to essentially be rest stops. There are about a, 
Camels can go 100 miles before they need rest and water. So a lot of these trade areas, almost like little mini cities for merchants, are going to be about 100 miles apart from each other. And it's a place that a merchant can go from, for example, here to here. I don't know, maybe let's say it's about 100 miles. Your camel can chill out, rest, drink. You can drink, you can get supplies, you might negotiate, you might trade at this caravan sarai and negotiate a deal and then keep going. Or maybe you turn back because you got what you want. But this is some examples of what it looked like along the Silk Road. These are, they're almost like little mini hotels in a sense. And you'd pay, you'd go, and then you continue on. You'll notice that along all these dots represent the different caravansaris uh, places. Um, it gets heavier and more densely populated the closer you get to the Middle East, which is really the center in a sense of trade because a lot of people are traveling there and coming there to trade. So this is the caravan. So, right, so these two things, just coming back, this is the promotion of trade. You got money, you got credit, you got caravan. So right, this is promoting trade and increasing trade. The effect of this, so again, I'm gonna come back. We're gonna talk about these terms a lot moving forward. These are causes, three causes of the increase in trade. This is, these are the effects. Number one, what we see is the growth of new cities. Cities that did not exist before are now going to exist along the Silk Road. I want to point out this one right here, which is Kaifeng, which is located right here. This is like the largest, arguably the largest city in the world around 1200. Had a million people living here um, at the time, which is pretty significant. Um, it had four canals. It had the first ever fire department in the world, which is a pretty, I guess, pretty big deal. They also, kind of a fun fact, side note, they had a thousand Jewish settlers here who traveled along the Silk Road in order probably to avoid persecution and settled in Jai, Jai Fang. But the uh, essentially essentially the census at the time shows about a thousand um, Jewish people living there. So it kind of shows it's like an international cultural city. We also have um, Hangzhou right here, which is one of the larger populations. We have Merv, great name for a town, which was in Persia. Um, Gorjan right here. And of course, Baghdad, which was part of the Islamic Caliphate. So these are the cities and you can see they're right along the Silk Road. So as people are trading, they're going to settle in urban areas because people are going to, one, people are going to settle there who are merchants. Also, people are going to move there who are selling products because they know it's a way to increase your goods and increase your profit. Um, also, one of the other reasons that we're going to see are the effects of the increase in trade on the Silk Road is an increased demand of luxury goods. As people get their, stop for a second. Luxury goods are things that the everyday ordinary person can't afford. All right. The wealthy merchants, wealthy artisans, wealthy Confucian scholars in China, people outside of China in the Islamic Caliphate, for example, who can afford these goods, they're luxury goods. They're not something you need to survive. They're just luxurious to show off and to show, you know, how powerful you are. So we're going to see a demand for luxury goods. A couple things from China, iron and steel. China learns how to develop iron and steel products. We're going to see the production of better farm equipment that's not going to break, nails for ships that can actually go into wood and withstand the elements, better hammers, bridges, things that are going to really increase warfare and increase trade and increase food production. We're also going to have a grand canal because of this iron and steel, which is going to link the north to the south of China. So the Grand Canal is going to come down here, linking the north to the south. And this Grand Canal is going to allow industrial type products from the north to go to the south and farm products, especially rice, to go from the south to the north. Um, also, we're going to have access to porcelain. These are two examples of Song era porcelain. Um, this is what people refer to as fine china. Your family members might have fine china that they bring out for special occasions or holidays. Um, it's referred to as fine china because people from other parts of the world, it, they knew it. the best porcelain comes from China. And for the most part along the Silk Road, wealthy people are going to use this. It's going to be for decoration or maybe for practical purposes that you don't, but usually it's just to show, hey, look, man, I'm rich. I got some fancy jade china right here. Um, the further you get away from China, the more prestigious it is to own this porcelain. Because you can imagine, it's got to go a long freaking way. Imagine you're on a camel from Jaifang to Shang'an all the way across Mongolia and the steppes of Central Asia. You got to make it. It's got to not fall and break. And the camel, I don't know if camels buck or like get up, but you got to keep it. And if you can, if you're all the way here in Constantinople and you got access to China, imagine how many people have their hands on that China to trade it there. 
and then eventually to make it to you, you got to have some cash and some dough to, to pay for that. Lastly is just textiles. Textiles is a fancy name for cotton. Producing cotton, taking the cotton ball, making it into clothing is referred to as textile. The textile is this, this shirt right here. All right, this is a textile. In China, they are going to produce these textiles. A lot of the cotton is going to be grown in India and Persia. Um, in these areas here, it's going to come into China and China is going to produce a lot of these textiles, which is going to lead to an increase in trade along the Silk Road. Cotton is much more comfortable than what the Western European feudalists were wearing, which was like wool shirts. Now you got cotton. It's nice and airy. It's comfy. You can put Phillies logos on it. You can do whatever you want. Um, it's going to be expensive to purchase, but the Europeans, not to get too fast forward here, but the Europeans are going to get their hands on it and want a little more of all of these things, which is going to lead to a little exploration. But that's another story for another day. That's my Silk Road. One last piece of this. Just want to point out that like one person's not traveling this whole 6,000 mile journey. Little stops along the way. You trade this, then that person goes and brings it here to someone else, to someone else, and it's going to go all on the route. So just want to point that out too. There's not one guy or one girl going 6,000 miles. That's what I got. As always, any questions, write it down. Let me know. Have a good day. I'm out.